I didn't give this passage to Kathy because I just thought of it this morning. <laughs> but uh, in Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 and following, you might want to turn there. So we're not going to go there now, but later when I address that passage, you'll be able to get to that if you have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, shame on you. But I don't want you to live in shame, so don't live in that shame. But shame on you for a minute. Bring your Bibles. Learn to... I'm old school. You know, I'm over 70. Ooh, ooh. And, uh, and I love pages. I've had one of those things where you're, you're reading, you know, the... Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Kindle, yeah, I have a Kindle. That's how much I use it. Uh, it was very difficult to read that for me. Uh, I do read computer screens regularly nowadays, but I have a big one, you know, so I do read uh, that, but there's something about pages. Uh, by the way, it's good to be back. The reason and I were on a little vacation. Uh, we took a four-day vacation uh, to go hear some classical music in, in San Diego. The classical uh, uh, philharmonic is called Grand Funk Railroad. And so we, we heard them, uh, their old school uh, from when, you know, we were in high school <laughs> group. And so they're old guys up there moving, you know, trying to do their thing. But it's fun to watch them. Are they going to fall? Oh, you know. <laughs> you know, so it's exciting on a different, different levels. Uh, so anyway, we, we went to San Diego and we had a good find. She's my, literally, she's my best friend. And so I love being with her when we're in those places together. And so it's good to be back this year. I mean this year, this week. And thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason, for teaching last week. Um, uh, I think what he said was vital for us to hear. You know, the, the Bible, you know, there's two uh, edges to it. Uh, there's a word for that. Um, the Bible is a reet. That would be a word. The Bible is a reet. Anyway. That said, uh, there's, there's two edges and makes one fine edge, and that's this, that, uh, that the Bible wants you to be assured of your salvation. It doesn't want you to be living in fear of your salvation, but in the confidence of a son or a daughter. The Bible gives us assurance of salvation based not on our works or our ability to do the right stuff to get to heaven, but it's built on and based on what Christ Jesus has done for you and what he's done for me. So that the assurance of salvation doesn't come with, am I good enough? Have I gone to church enough? And my answer to you would be, no, you haven't. Uh, sorry, that's a little jab for those of you who aren't regular. And so I, I would say that you, you need to, you, you, maybe you needed to give a little bit more. You know, I saw the, I'm, I'm never, I'm always up here usually in worship, so I don't get to see the screen like you do. And I saw three ways to give. I'm so sorry, oh, it's okay. The, um, this mic isn't working. Do you want to turn that off and then just keep speaking? This one isn't working? Yeah. Test one. There it goes. Test one, two, test. Right. Test, is that better? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. If you want something technically done, just call me. <laughs> Mr. Tech is what they call me. <laughs> so, um, uh, where was I there? At the beginning, where? <laughs> no. Yeah, three ways to give. Yeah. <laughs> hey, real funny, real, real funny. You can dump them right over that little edge if you'd like. <laughs> But there's three ways to give it set up there. And I thought, you know, we kind of go through that kind of fast, but how important it is that we give. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a different way. But how vital it is that our life isn't based on the assurance of our works, but the assurance of Jesus. But the assurance of Jesus needs to reflect an outcome a measure that says, I'm saved. How do you know you're saved? Because my life acts like it. I act like it. So the other fine line of the Bible is this. If you're not acting like a Christian, check yourself. Maybe you're not. 
See, that's the fine edge. The fine edge is have assurance of, of salvation, but check your life and make sure that your life isn't like, I, I go to church on Sunday and I know scripture verses and, and I pray before we eat food, but I treat my neighbor like he's a jerk and I make sure he knows I'm a, he's a jerk. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, and you can name off a lot of things that would say, are you really walking like Jesus? I don't mean here, we all fail and fall. But I mean a lifestyle that says, yeah, he's no different than the guy who doesn't know Jesus. And if somebody is in a life that, that isn't different, then before you said you knew Jesus, then you need to question whether you have faith or not. So back to Jason's message out of the book of James, is that there should be a reflection of Jesus in your life that tells you that you belong to Jesus. So James, the message of James is, as he said, well, I'm not trying to redo what he says, but it works into what I'm saying this morning, is that, is that your life is that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus, and it ought to come out in good works. It ought to come out in the way that you live your life. Because if it isn't, then you need to question your life. So, we're here on a different message, but at the end, it'll make more sense to you as to how it adds up to James. But in Acts chapter 3, we're going to continue some thoughts that we had there a couple weeks ago and go into Acts chapter 4, and at the end of Acts chapter 4, we'll visit something that I've just said to you already. Are you confused? Okay, well, hang on. I'll, I'll confuse you in a minute. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time together, for the wonder of your word and the power and the authority of it. So, Father, as it enters into our ears and our minds, may the very power of your word transform the way that we think so that, Father, we might eventually, if not soon, feel the reality of your truth inside of us. So, Jesus, come now and minister freely to these dear ones here and those who may be listening. And I pray, Father, you would put a fire under the believers, both here and listening. Do not neglect our need to be together, our need to continue to foster unity and to work at intentionally being a church of oneness in the midst of our diversity. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So let me start off with this. <clears throat> when you do something that's not good and you get called on it, you usually don't go, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. We usually get a little defensive. Okay, I'm just talking about me. I get defensive. Especially when my best friend says something, and it's true, but I don't want it to be true. I go, who are you to say, you know, and I, and I fight back. Right away, I, I get defensive. And then after a while, I come back and I go, you know what you said is probably true. I'm sorry for reacting that way. Because I get defensive. I, what am I trying to defend? my sense of honor. For me, I have a real kind of need inside to be right. And so if somebody says I'm wrong, I'm going to fight against that. And then I realized, no, I can't be right. In fact, I'm wrong a lot, except on Sundays. I'm never wrong on Sundays. But on other days, I could be wrong. So I have to go like this. Sorry. I have to keep fighting this thing in me that always wants to be right. Anybody like that, Frank? <laughs> You're going to get it all morning long, Frank. So, so here's the deal is that, is that when we do good things and somebody doesn't like it, sometimes it's even worse because it's like, no. There's something that rises up in us, no, I, I, I did a good thing. This is a good thing. And then we really want to attack the person 
who is coming after us for doing the best thing or what you believe is the right thing. In fact, there are those sometimes that I have little power struggles with in this. In this I want to make sure that, that you know I did the right thing. And so there's this thing in us that rises up. We call it pride. <clears throat> I think that Jason referred to that last week as well, this idea of pride, how it wells up in us and wants to be in control, wants to be right, uh, wants to lead, uh, wants to have an air of approval and, and being you know, somebody that we're not, all that, all that ucky, ucky stuff. Well, in the book of Acts, chapter 3 and chapter 4, we find that Peter and John, two apostles, two disciples of Jesus, are new men. Their lives are different. They walked with Jesus. And as they walked with Jesus, they discovered new things and new ways and they saw Jesus and, and they went wow who is this guy and they, be, they began to become more like Jesus by just spending time with Jesus and recognizing that his way was the way and they were trying to discard their way and make his way their way but they stumbled through it and they did their whole lives but they stumbled differently when they were with Jesus because something happened when Jesus left. Jesus always keeps his promises. Do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember what Jesus, is that working now? No, it's not working. All right. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> No, 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 no. What's that? Well, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think exactly the scripture, but he, but that's that's true. What what Jesus had said to them essentially is this: is that when I leave, you'll do even greater things than me. When I live, when I leave, you'll do greater things than me. Now we want to go like this. Yeah, right. Not my life. Well, in your life by itself, you can't. But Jesus, when he left, said that there would be a time and a day when the Holy Spirit will come. Because I'm going, another one like me is going to come, and he'll be with you, and he'll be, are you ready? What? In you. And as the Holy Spirit is in you, He'll give you a power to live the Christian life and to begin to see all of the world through the lens of truth, the Bible. And it'll be this new thing in you that'll make you alive in a different way so that your life will be different if you really know Jesus. And the bottom line will be that your life is revealing the power of Jesus in you. Because you'll be changing, maybe slower than you'd like, but some things will change right away. What changes right away is that, ah, this is true. You begin to understand that truth is truth, and it begins to do something inside of you. Something happens right away. You realize you have a different identity. Your identity is now connected to this Jesus person. But then he gives you the Holy Spirit and he comes inside of you. So we have Peter and John who walked with Jesus and were looking at his life and going, wow, this is incredible. We love this guy. Eventually they come to the realization this is the Messiah, not the one we wanted, but the one that is. And then Jesus left. And then the Holy Spirit came inside of them. And they began to now live out a Jesus kind of life. So we find in Acts chapter 3 
two men who are different than when you read them or read about them in the gospel stories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we're in the book of Acts, and they're different. Jesus is no longer with them in person, but the Holy Spirit is in them. And so we read, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And we've read this before a couple weeks back, if you may not remember, but I had mentioned this fact that they didn't have a good social security system there, and, and people in this condition uh, begged for, for it. And there were those alongside the community who were organizations, and, and within them, they would help people like this out by carrying them to the place where they could best ask for alms for, for the poor and for the sick. And in fact, the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, they used to give a lot of their life away to the temple work and to the things of God. And the the top 10% of their giving, by the way, the word tithe comes from this 10th idea in the Old Testament. Now, they didn't have cash they dealt in their goods and in the agriculture that this culture was enmeshed in. So they were called to give the first 10% of their fruit away to the things of God. Now think about that just for a moment. When somebody is in need, I give them my leftovers. Do I have a shirt I don't like anymore? Or I don't want? Give it away. And we feel really good about that. Go give away your good shirt. Feel better about that. But anyway, that's a whole different thing. So we give away our leftovers and we feel good about that. But in the Old Testament, they gave, they gave the 10% of their first fruits, the best stuff, give that to God. You know what the temple did with that stuff? It did the things of God and gave to the poor. Their job was to give to the poor and to the things of the temple. We get that idea of tenth. If we want to talk about tithing, which is not the message this morning, don't be afraid, (laughs) is that the idea of tithing comes from that idea of of we give the best of our stuff to God because we belong to God. And He gives us everything we have. So, It's only right to give the best to the one who provides it to us. And then they use it to give to the poor. So you want to give to the poor? Stop giving your leftovers. That's just a thought. When they come to the beautiful gate and this lame beggar is there, he sees Peter and John, they're going to enter the temple And he asked them for money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. And in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. What has he given them? the authority of Christ in them to make this pronouncement. Do they make it all the time to everybody? No. But something inside of Peter compelled him to say what Jesus wanted to say. Get up and walk. He gets up and he walks. He's healed. Is that a good thing? Yeah, it's a great thing, right? Is that a great thing? Yeah, it's a great thing. Think about it. A man who's crippled his whole life gets up and walks in the name of Jesus, the Nazarene. 
That is really wonderful stuff. And if you haven't been healed from something that you know God has healed you from, that has really been a terrible thing, you maybe don't get the essence of this healing. The wonder or the beauty of it. I just heard the story of a, a pastor in the UK who was, who was a good neighbor to a neighbor and the neighbor really never was walking with Jesus but, but they were Jesus to the neighbor and then finally the neighbor got ill when he was away and long story short went into a coma into a dreadful state and had no more brain function so he gets a word saying that uh, this person uh, has no more brain function they told the family that in five days they're going to cut them off from any kind of artificial uh, uh, assistance to, to stay alive, at least within their bodies. So because there's no brain function, we're going to uh, terminate her life at that time. And so he got back just, to, they asked the family, can we pray? They should, sure, of course you can. So he got back on the fifth day, him and his wife went, and they prayed with her the sinner's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. And she opened her eyes. And she was healed. He goes, get this, because I don't get this. She's still not a Christian. But God brought her back to life. I have no idea where that story is now. I didn't follow that story up. But when you experience that, you're not the same. I mean, I'm talking about the one praying for her. I don't know why she is the same, but, but I would not be the same. I've been transformed by seeing God work in people's lives. I'm transformed partly by seeing God work in your lives as He changes things in you that need to be changed. It's wonderful to see the transformation of souls becoming more like Jesus. See, it happens. We really do change. Slower than we'd like. But we change. We're not the same. And then they're persecuted for doing good. Let's get to that point. Remember, we don't like it when people call us on things that we know we don't do well. Even worse, when we do something good and somebody doesn't like it. Well, they didn't like it. Who didn't like it? Remember two weeks ago, the political structure of the day hated that they did this. Both the religious and just the pure political did not like this stuff happening because people's hearts were being turned towards Jesus. And who hates that more than anything? The devil, Satan hates that more than anything. And he will gather up a storm of those who will be against Jesus. However it comes out in life. And Satan wants to eat you up. And he wants to dismantle your life so that you're ineffective for Christ. And so Satan has raised up a political army against him. Again, I mean, Satan has, has uh, built up a political army against Jesus and, and a religious army against Jesus. And it tells us that, that they get in trouble for doing something good. So we'll go to, there's things we're not going to read. I, I don't need to because we read it a couple of weeks ago, but now in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. This is a political battle. It's a real cultural battle. 
It's a personal battle to those who make a living by not having a Jesus. We'll get to that in a minute. But many of the people who heard their message had believed it. And up to 5,000 men, not including now the families that they're going to affect, came to know Jesus. Now I want to stop here just for one second to give you a little personal testimony. By the way, uh, I know that last week someone told me, or no, I mean, um, Sean told me he was going to go share his story. I had mentioned, go tell your story. Let me tell you a little part of my story. And I'm going to make it real, real brief. Some of you heard part of this, I know. But my grandfather uh, was in the Pueblo, Colorado area. I think it's, no, Rocky Ford? Rocky Ford, Colorado. Had, uh, had fled there from Chihuahua because of the revolution. Was involved with uh, various things there. Uh, had, had, I believe, his boys there. And then it came to Ontario and then had three bratty daughters. <laughs> One of them's in the back. I'm not going to even point her out. And, and, and unfortunately, my, my grandfather had went on a, uh, and went through a difficult period. And again, making a long story short, and I had told this last night, so it reminded me of this. Uh, so thank you for bringing it up, Jason. So anyway, um, uh, long story short, uh, he, he's becoming um, incapacitated by his drinking and by his picadillos, <laughs> which is his sins. And he was becoming wayward. And then one day he comes home and comes to his house and they lived off Sultana and Maitland below Mission Avenue in Ontario. And he tells my grandmother that he's come to know Jesus. He's come to know Jesus. Now I say that story because he being a man ended up bringing the whole family to Jesus. Even though when he said he'd come to Jesus, my grandmother got a hold of the priests and the nuns, they came to the house and they forbid him to come back to the house. Back in those days, there was that tension, the fight between the Catholic Church and those who were claiming to be Jesus followers or Protestants, protesters. And so that was the deal. And then eventually, in their state of working through things, tried to invite my grandmother to go to the little church with him, and she would not go. And then she, she was talked into it because they said on Christmas, they have stockings with fruit and nuts and candy in it. If we bring every kid, we got seven stockings of some kind of food. And they go there and she accepts Jesus. And their lives are changed forever. Well, that's all the story I'm going to tell you, but here's the deal. Is that the seed of Christ in one man, the good of that will change change people's lives from generation to generation to generation. Strongholds will be destroyed when Jesus is let into the heart of a man. Let Jesus into your heart. Because there are strongholds here that need to be broken and you must start by letting Jesus in. Because for many generations to come, people's lives will be changed and be prepared to go to heaven. And so it is that 5,000 men had believed. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander and other relatives of the high priest. Very religious and very political. They brought in the two disciples and demanded by what power or in whose name have you done this? Why are they mad about something good? Because something good 
is going to pull at the hearts of where they get their worth and their value from people bowing to them. The power that they have to wield and to feel important. If this Jesus, if he comes here and takes away their hearts, then we'll have no hearts. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says this. The stone that you builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So let me talk to you and to those who are listening. That there's no other way to get to heaven but through Jesus. None. Zero. Not your good works. Not the guy down the street. Not your money. Not not a, a, a eastern God. Not a another God. Not any God. Not any way. There's nothing that you can do to get to heaven except by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's it. That are not, that's not my words. It's the words of the scripture. There's no room. There's no room to say that Jesus is anything but the Messiah when he says this. There's no room. He's not a good guy. And not the Messiah. He's not a good guy but also the only way, but he didn't really have to be the only way. No, he's a nut if he's saying that and you don't believe it. But Jesus is Lord and he is the only way to heaven and he says it with clarity to them. In Acts 13, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Why were they so amazed? You know why? Because they weren't seminary graduates. They hadn't gone to Bible school. But what had they done? They had spent time with Jesus. And Jesus will change your heart, your mind, your soul. Jesus will transform you if you let him in. He'll make you a new person. And they'll go, you know, so-and-so down the street, um, uh, Irene. She was always so snobby. Always her chin up. But she's been so kind to me lately. What's up with that? Jesus changes us. Something happens to us when Christ comes into our lives. We become new people in Jesus. When we spend time with Jesus, we can't stay the same. So they said regarding the boldness of Peter and John. Remember, Peter's the guy who denied Jesus one time, two times, three times. They could not see that they were ordinary men, with, they, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. Anybody that guy? You ordinary man with no special training, this is people. You all raise your hand, at least most of you, right? We're ordinary people. No special training. We're like them. We're like Peter and we're like John. But they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. 
Jesus changes lives. You cannot stay the same. You know, those of us who are believers love certain people more than others. We want to learn to love everybody. But there are those who we're close to and we, we go, uh, uh, yeah, I, I heard them mutter one day in their sleep, Jesus, I know that they're saved. Are their lives different? No, but I know they're saved because they said it. We need to stop that. Somehow trying to tack on salvation to a life that hasn't been changed. Because Jesus changes your life. And if a life isn't changed, their confession is really no confession. And I encourage you to find ways to minister to them as though they didn't know Jesus. Love them. Don't pound them. Don't be an idiot. Don't be some religious bigot. Just love them, but help them to see Jesus and pray for their salvation. Because real salvation comes with real change. Real change. In Acts 4, 16 through 21, we'll read, what should we do with these men who've done this thing that are taking the hearts of people? They asked each other this question. We can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign. And everybody in Jerusalem knows about it but to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further we must warn them not to speak to anyone Jesus in Jesus' name again <laughs> I love this because what a joke we're going to tell them not, not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore so they called the apostles back in and commanded them never to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And I love the reply, because this must be our reply to the world. It must be our reply to the government. Or the political rulers that rule, whoever. Are you ready? Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than Him? Close the doors. Close the doors of your church. You may catch a bug. Bars can stay open. They're essential. But not the church. Close the doors. Hogwash. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. They will not stop telling the story of Jesus. The council threatened them further, dot, 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 dot. That must be our response. And then here's the prayer. We mentioned this a couple weeks ago as well. The prayer that the early church has regarding this whole incident isn't God, smite those evil politicians, smite those evil religious people, move them out of the way. They say as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers, which is the church, and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why are the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with false plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord, against his Messiah. They're talking about the heart of the world that isn't the body of Christ. The heart of the prince of the power of the air is against Jesus the Messiah. Why? In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, 
the governor, these are the politicians. The Gentiles, the non-Jews, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, this is still their prayer. This is still their, their talking together. And now, O oh Lord, hear the threats and give us your servants a way out. If you're not reading with me, it doesn't say that. Hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Another version says, give us courage to be who we're supposed to be even when somebody says, don't be that. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They know the healing isn't through them, it isn't them, it's Christ in them. It's Christ who is doing this work through the body of Christ. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Something happened. We're still in a transition in the book of Acts. We're still moving from people who knew about Jesus and his resurrection, but were not familiar or aware of this new age where now the Holy Spirit would come upon those who would believe. It's the age that you live in. When you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and will reside in you and give you power to tell the Jesus story through your life. And there'll be real change in your life when you come to Jesus. And here's the wonderful thing that happens when we come to Jesus. All the believers in verse 32 were united in heart and mind. Side note. If we're united in heart and mind as believers, what does Satan want to do? Divide you. Give you ill feelings for other people in the church. To talk about others when they're not there. When it's negative. Church, we usually don't offer this, but I was sitting here thinking about it. How the church chooses its sins to pick on. All sins are bad. Sexual sins are bad. Addiction sins are bad. We pick on those. But we don't pick on things like we eat too much. We gossip too much. We live in a gossip-fueled world. That's what social media is. Our ability to talk bad about others without any real consequence because we're not face-to-face. -face. It's the ill of the internet you know why men are drawn to pornography? Because there's no ill effect. Nobody will reject them. They'll feel like that person on the screen loves them. And whatever it is they're doing is for them. They'll never feel rejection. There's never a risk. There's all kinds of terrible things regarding that issue. But that specifically is that when we're not face to face, we do terrible things. And when we have no God, we'll believe anything. So social media becomes an empowerment to talk bad about others when they're not present. So let me give you a general rule. If there's something negative you have about somebody in your heart or mind, talk about it with them. Never talk about them with somebody else when they're not there. Let's pick on that sin. We'll find another one next week. Let's just pick on that one for this week. They were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. Listen to this. This is going to get a little spooky for you. All right? You're going to go like this. What do I do with that? And then we're going to close. Cause we're, I'm probably going to go over a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Because we're going to go to, remember, Mark chapter 10. 
I didn't forget. We're going to read a little something there. But let me read this to you, and let me kind of put some real fear into your hearts, okay? Here's some fear into your hearts. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they thought that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. They were, there was no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring them, anybody uncomfortable yet? Let me keep reading. And bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. You sweating yet? Hang on. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas which means son of encouragement. And he was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. You want to talk about unity? You want to talk about oneness? You want to talk about body life? Anybody sweating yet? No, it's because you don't own anything. How many of you owners are sweating? What's happening here? Well, a great work in the spirit. This is not a command. This is not like, you know, the 11th commandment. When you come to Jesus, sell all you have and give it to the pastors. Well, it might be. No, it's not. It's not the 11th commandment. It's telling you what happens when the spirit of God comes into men and people. The bottom line is this, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. I'm not my own. I do not belong to myself, and everything I have belongs to God. That's the message. Let's just go over briefly to Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read out of the NIV version. I was at dinner with Reese and I with some, some good friends who happened to be very wealthy friends. Very wealthy friends. Without going into all of that. We're having dinner. They made dinner. Great dinner. The finest wine. The finest lobster. The finest food. We were eating And for some reason, I just thought I needed to open my big mouth. (laughs) And I meant no disrespect. I I just want to have good conversation. And so I referred to this passage. I just said, what do you think it meant when this guy comes to Jesus and says, hey, man, how do I get eternal life? Well, have you done A, B, C, and D? Yeah, I've done A, B, C, and D. Okay, then go sell everything you have This is a rich man. Go sell everything you have and follow me. And the Bible says, the young rich man hung his head down and walked away sad. I said to them, the table, what do you think Jesus meant by that? They gave me their opinions. I thought they were good ones. I told Therese, I'm going to write something and send it to, to both families to what I think it really means here in this passage. Let me read it to you, and we'll kind of close with this idea. But I want you to sweat bullets. I just want you to know that when Jesus comes into your life, you must have a changed life. And how you view the things you have is kind of the bottom line. You ever heard of the bottom line? There's somebody, you know, uh, Pastor Jason is, is a, a, like, a lot like Paul in regards to the fact that he's a pastor here, but he also works a full-time job. He's a tent maker, except they're not tents, they're other things. And, and, um, and, and, and they say, here's, here's, here's what's important for us as a company. Camaraderie, safety, Go on and on. All the things are important to this company. And I know somebody else who's part of a company. And they say, here's what's important. They even have their own little yell together when they're together as a group, a corporate group. But, but both people have told me within these organizations, but it all comes down to this, the bottom line. 
You do all the ha ha la 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 love. If you aren't meeting the bottom line, then we're going to fire you and get somebody else who will. Because what really matters is the bottom line. Why? Because you can measure the bottom line. You can't measure the ha ha la 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 stuff. Oh, looks good. But the bottom line we can measure. So let me just end with this idea. The bottom line for your life and for my life too is my money. What do I do with my money? Is it God's or is it mine? Whose is it? Are you sure it's God's? Do we live like it's God's? See, the real point here is who is the Lord, the master of your life? What's your bottom line? What's your bottom line? That it all belongs to Jesus. And so Jesus tells this rich young ruler, Jesus started his way and a man runs up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus said. No one is good, but it goes on through some stuff. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept. I'm, I'm skipping stuff because of time, but essentially he says, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, um, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud or honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at, that was the ABCs I was talking about earlier. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I, I, I love that there. By the way, many scholars believe that this rich young ruler ended up becoming saved and is actually the Mark who wrote this account of the gospel. But let me go on. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough, right? At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad he had, because he had great wealth. What was his bottom line? Jesus is just helping him see what his bottom line is. His bottom line is his money. It ain't God. His bottom line was that. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't the Messiah. It was his money. And I bet if this guy had said, you know what? I'll do it all. Jesus might have said, no, you don't need to. Follow me. Because you have. Because you just told me where your heart is. See, where's your heart? The bottom line in your life will tell you where your heart is. And oftentimes our money is telling us where our heart is. We don't like that because those kinds of things don't do much but tell us the truth. Me and Therese, we look at our checkbook and we go like this, dang, we spend so much money on food. How many times have we gone to the, and we realize we spend a ton of money on food. I worship broccoli. <laughs> Good cuts of beef. We've got to measure ourselves. Where is our, where's our life? Where, where's our hearts? That's why Jesus says, when you come to him, the bottom line becomes him. And the oneness of the church is that when they gave away, when they sold their land and brought it to the church, they're going, my bottom line is the will of God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come in my life and thy will be done in my life. That's what happens to a believer. We change. May you find it in your heart to let Jesus in. Because he'll change you. 
He'll make you more like Him. Some of you, you're kind of like not letting Him in. Let Him in. Follow Him. Because then you have everything you'll ever need. Everything. See, you can give everything up because He is everything. Now and forever. Jesus is everything. So Jesus has no problem saying, sell all that you have, give everything away and follow me. Because I am everything. I mean, you know the Christ, the one who holds all things in His hands, including you and your life, and will determine where you go to eternity. May you know this God of heaven and earth who sent Jesus' his Son to die for you. May you know this Christ. May you be changed and live a life that reflects the wonder of Christ in you, the hope of glory.